traditions of Central Asia and to many Buddhists, Tibet is known as the pure land of the Buddha. Here for well over a thousand years, the teachings of Lord Buddha have been practiced and preserved. Buddhism was actively patronized by the state and affected every Tibetan's thoughts and acts. His Holiness the 14th reincarnated Dalai Lama is both religious and secular leader to the Tibetan people. In this film, he is about to enter a very important stage of his life. Like every Lama or monk who aspires to the coveted title of Geshe, or Doctor of Theology, he must first undergo a rigorous examination. In the Valley of Lhasa, capital city of Tibet, His Holiness and his retinue are proceeding on their journey to Ganden Monastery. Accompanied by civil, military, lay, and monk officials, the procession makes a splendid sight for the people of Lhasa gathered to see the departure. Ordinarily, a monk may pass his examination at any of the three great monasteries near Lhasa, or at the combined meeting of the monks of these monasteries during the Mun Lam, or January Prayer Festival. However, as the head of all monasteries, the Dalai Lama must sit for separate examinations at the monasteries of Serra, Drepung, and Ganden and finally at the Mun Lam festival in the central cathedral of Lhasa. At this stage of the journey, His Holiness is transported in the royal palanquin, which Tibetans call Pepchong. Close behind the palanquin follow cabinet ministers and the Dalai Lama's personal tutors. Along the roadside are government officials in ancient costumes dating back to the early kings of Tibet and worn only on very special occasions. At wayside stops, representatives from the area wait to greet the Dalai Lama. Ganden Monastery is about 40 miles east of Lhasa. From this point on, the terrain becomes steep, and palanquin gives way to a more practical kind of transportation. Ganden Monastery, founded by Tsongkhapa in 1409, is the third largest monastery in Tibet, housing 3,300 monks. It is an established tradition for all visiting Dalai Lamas to dismount and prostrate themselves before the Golden Mausoleum, in which the mortal remains of Tsongkhapa are preserved. Tsongkhapa literally means the man from Onion Land, which is descriptive of his humble beginnings. But he was to become one of the greatest scholars of Tibet, revered as the founder of the Gelukpa sect. Incense is burned from the roof of the monastery, signaling the approach of the Dalai Lama. Under the golden roof lies the tomb of Tsongkhapa. The assembled monks are gathered in the examination area as His Holiness, his advisors and ministers arrive. There are many different schools of Buddhist thought in Tibet. However, the difference between them lies solely in their method of teaching and their devotion to the founder or lama and in the character of their rituals, not in fundamental religion and philosophy. Their inspiration and goal are the same, salvation or final escape from rebirth with the attainment of nirvana. And although each sect has its own leader, they are all joined under the guidance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. There are many orders of Geshe, the highest being the Tlarampa. On the average, 
A monk spends 20 to 30 years in hard study at the monasteries in order to pass the examination for the degree of Geshe. The examination is conducted orally and in the form of debates, which cover such subjects as Buddhist philosophy, transcendental wisdom, metaphysics, logic, and dialectics. The debates are attended and judged by the abbots of the monasteries and other learned men. The examination debate proceeds with syllogisms, examples, quotations, in a rapid fire of questions and answers, which testify to the candidate's mastery of the subject. In all religious debate and discussion, the original teachings of Buddha and the commentaries of the Pandits are constantly cited to authenticate the validity of the points being debated. Tibetans believe it is as important to be able to ask the right questions as it is to answer. Therefore, at the end of each examination, the candidate, in this case the Dalai Lama himself, is tested for his ability to question his examiners. The gestures made by both examiner and candidate are quite meaningful. Raising the right hand symbolizes an act of rising to the state of enlightenment. The lowering of the left hand signifies suppression of ignorance and delusion. The clapping of hands indicates that an answer should be given. The display of banners and awnings signify an auspicious occasion. With the completion of the examination, his Holiness leaves the monastery, preceded by monks carrying incense burners, while behind him follow two monks carrying umbrellas, one of peacock feathers, the other of yellow silk, denoting the Dalai Lama's rank. the surrounding villages, Tibetans have come to Ganden in the hope of seeing His Holiness. They pitch tents for shelter during their stay. Now that the official ceremony is over, the entourage goes on a sightseeing tour. Astride sure-footed yaks, native to Tibet, they climb to the top of Mount Onkuri. From the summit of the mountain, there is a vast panoramic view. Prayer flags are a familiar sight throughout Tibet. Prayers are printed on paper and cloth and strung across the high mountain passes and peaks frequented by travelers.
the procession reaches the wayside tents of the Dalai Lama, abbots, monks, and local people come to pay their respect to His Holiness. Seated on the traditional shukri, he receives the visitors, who prostrate themselves on leaving as a gesture of reverence and farewell. Majestically over the city of Lhasa is the Potala, winter palace of the Dalai Lama, centuries old, with more than a thousand rooms. In the heart of Lhasa is Chokang Cathedral, built in the 7th century by Songsan Gampo, 33rd king of Tibet. This gigantic cathedral accommodates more than 20,000 monks during the prayer festival. And it is here that the final examination will take place. This most difficult stage of initiation lasts 10 hours, and more than 50 examiners will take part in the questioning. They include abbots and geshes from the two tantric colleges of Lhasa, in addition to the learned lamas and monks from all the corners of Tibet. The golden roofs of Chokang welcome the procession as it enters the examination area. During the examination, government officials and other spectators look on from their balcony positions. Once more, a lifetime of intensive religious training and reflection on the part of the Dalai Lama is put to test. Many of the questions asked during the debates relate to the four noble truths, suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path which leads to its cessation. These constitute the basis of Buddhist philosophy. The question may be asked, is there nirvana or state of complete enlightenment? Or the candidate may be challenged with the question, how do we know there is an afterlife? The final examination is over, and His Holiness has acquitted himself with honor. With the religious ceremony at an end, government officials take their leave. Now is the time to celebrate the success of the Dalai Lama's examinations and attainment of Geshe.
This small piece of road in Tibet is the subject of our film, together with these Chinese trucks and the rebels who ambushed them. They are Kamba guerrillas, exiled from Tibet, but of vital importance to India and China in their power struggle for the Himalayas. frontier of rock and ice, the Himalayas seem cast by nature to keep India and China apart. Yet somewhere below, some incident every year brings the world close to war. On our flight is George Patterson, an authority on the Himalayan conflict between Peking and Delhi. We jointly believe that the most unpredictable factor in the shifting balance of power is the guerrilla army inside Tibet. So we're flying together to Kathmandu, capital of Nepal, to contact the agents of the Kamba guerrillas. For George, Kathmandu is a great passageway between India and Tibet. Everything comes from these two countries, everything yearns back to them. Tibetan deities and Indian gods. Nepal is the chameleon of Asia, and so the streets are home for the spies of two nations, and the palace traditionally balances India's power against Tibet's. But at our visit, the Prime Minister is playing this historical game through an unusual form of diplomacy. <laughs> To strange Nepali music, before an audience of diplomats, the king in the middle sits through a speech in a foreign language. Then the ruler of Nepal walks towards a new hospital. The hospital is given by people in America. Another day, another band. The king listens to another speech. And then into the terminus of a new ropeway, also given by the Americans. The ropeway replaces an old British given ropeway and carries freight to an Indian donated road. The king inspects it and a new Chinese road from a helicopter presented by the Russians. The Chinese move forward, but the Russians are waiting to help the king down. on the new Chinese Kodari road, surrounded by international present givers, the king knows that each gift binds the receiver, that this road makes Chinese invasion possible. It's a slightly comic game played against powerful opponents by a lone man who can do little but maneuver. But everyone knows the Kodari road changes the game itself. The jeep track will soon become the first highway on which tanks can move from China to India. Only 15 years ago, there were no proper roads in the Himalayas, till the Chinese opened the bidding by building the first military highway in Tibet. India countered with a road to Kathmandu, then matched by Chinese routes to the frontier. 
Finally, crossing the Himalayas, the Godari Road reaches Kathmandu and the city's calm seems one of suspense, as if waiting for the peace to shatter. Violent and hysterical, but the mob is religious, not political. The chariots and gods of Nepal's fanaticism have always come from India or China. Just as today the idealists with the cause, who maneuver in the back alleys, are those of the outlawed pro-Indian Congress Party and the outlawed pro-Chinese Communist Party. In the cafes, members of the parties meet. Both parties started revolutions recently and both are now contemplating revolutions that will favor either India or China. It's in this world of cafe intrigue and propaganda newspapers that the anti-communist Tibetans are to be found. One group produces a newspaper, but other groups deal with the Tibetan guerrillas. The cartoon is of Chinese tortures in Tibet. In different bars with different men, we arrange to march to the guerrilla's base on the border of Tibet. And then news breaks that an anti-Chinese politician has been assassinated. He was the prime minister of a neighboring Himalayan kingdom. And as his murderers are brought to trial, their confessions reveal a Chinese plot. From Bhutan, the crisis begins to spread. As troop movements flood the news, we want to know if the Kamba guerrillas could delay the Chinese divisions on the roads behind the frontier. The guerrillas have 5,000 men based on the Mustang region spread along the frontier, ambushing the Chinese highways. Our goal is a patrol at Zum Valley near the Kodari Road. Tibetan refugees who form the whole of our party, except for this Nepali liaison officer. Our porters never let him discover the objective of our journey. weeks and then the gorge leading to the sacred valley of Zum. Here one of Tibet's three patron images is guarded from the communists behind a gorge entrance marked with a Buddhist Mani inscription. In the valley of Zum, no animal may be killed, no blood may be spilt, and the people are led by the monastery at the center. The 
Dalai Lama's portrait carried back towards Tibet in hatred of the Chinese and in hope of reconquest. Many of the monks and people fled here from Tibet, so they're united and suspicious of outsiders. Our problem is to know which of these people are guerrillas and how to break the secret. Any man could be a Kamba without a gun, any tents could be a Kamba camp, and Tibetan valleys keep secrets for years. So in the main stone house, the chief of our porters establishes his credentials and ours before the headman. Ceremonial tea drinking goes on for several days as we explain why we want to assess and publicize the Kamba raids. Below, in our camp, the news is that war has not broken out, but that there's still considerable tension. And then, on the third day, we're surprised to hear from the headman that some Kamba guerrillas urgently need medicine. Apparently, a small patrol is camped not far from this house, just across the valley. There are only two tents and 17 men but one of them has gangrene, which George is asked to cut away. His foot was frostbitten on a raid in Tibet. George speaks fluent Kamba, and the second in command, Asang, recognizes him as the foreigner who lived with his warlord in Tibet. George explains our purpose, and Asang reveals that George helped when the Kambas planned their revolt against the Chinese to rescue the Dalai Lama. So the patrol leader, Tenda, offered to take us on a raid, if this was approved, in the monastery, before the sacred image. <laughs> The bowl contains two balls of dough, representing opposite decisions. Tender was a very devout man, and for him the paper contains the image's decision. It says, we are to enter Tibet. They're praying for the success of the raid and for the vindication of their persecuted religion. This group of Kambas move up the valley a few days later with guns and ammunition on a pack horse. We travel separately, saying we're going to film nomads in the higher mountain valleys. These nomads became desperate under the harsh terms of Chinese government. So they fled two months earlier, while our Kambas fought in the rear. A reminder that people are the subject of the war and that China was accused before the UN of genocide. Nomads move their tents freely, which is intolerable to a communist state, genuinely but forcibly reorganizing Tibet's economy. And so those who insist on the ancient freedom of the moving tent have been put in labor camps. The old have been liquidated and the young sent to China. And so too the nomads look on Tender as a savior and a protector. He's told that there are no Chinese patrols moving near the border and that the tribal council have agreed to guard all the passes to Tibet. Beyond the pass stands a Chinese post and these gnome-like figures are watching for any possible informers tempted by the head price on Cumbers. They watch into the middle of the next night. We're moving at night in case of Chinese spies. Fairly early, dawn begins to strike the tips of the mountains on the frontier. 
and by the time it's light, we're climbing in a part of the ranges where nobody lives. Ahead is our pass, but we rest at a camp set up by Kamba scouts sent over on previous nights. Tibetan tea mixed with yak butter. Then Tenda is told by the scouts about the ambush site. <coughs> The route they had chosen leads over a 20,000 foot pass and for the rest of this day we climb slowly. At this height the air is so thin that frequent stops are necessary for oxygen to re-enter the bloodstream. The Kamba's base is supplied regularly by secret airdrop and our patrol has one Bren and eight carbines or rifles. They say their suppliers limit ammunition to one raid a month and are against any major onslaught at present. But they're silent about which nation is supplying them. As we get higher, our movements become heavier and the cloud grows thicker. Welcome cover on the bare snow face from patrols sent out by the Chinese post to either side. It was nearly 13 hours since we set out. But at the summit, the Kambas paused to lay down Buddhist prayer flags to pray for their conquered country. At 20,000 feet from such hardened soldiers, it's an unexpected and pathetic ceremony. The flags are left an abandoned symbol in the snow as the Kambas cross the border into their equally abandoned country. Thirteen hours to go up, but going down of course is quicker. At last we see our first view of Tibet and our route to the ambush site lies beneath us. We're moving in narrow gullies so that it's difficult to be seen. By evening the terrain changes. We're to move concealed in the innumerable valleys and folds for most of this night. But back in Zoom Valley, we know that most of the inhabitants are praying for our success. Their faces are peasant faces from the center of Tibet, without the hard look of the bandit Kambas from the east. These men traditionally fear the Kambas, but because communism forced the Dalai Lama into flight, so they have united in a holy war. And so the whole valley prayed and the huge prayer wheel at the monastery turned incessantly on our behalf. By the second day, our route has taken us close to the Tibetan section of the Kadari Road between the Chinese garrisons Zonka and Kirong. As we hide in a fold of the ground and the Kambas clean their weapons, we learn from Tender that he deserted as a high-ranking monk when his family was liquidated. Kambas are traditionally unmoved by killing, but Tender is tortured by his damnation as a man of violence and is equally upset at this monastery nearby when he finds the scriptures and images smashed by the Chinese who publicly proclaim that they protect Buddhism. an ominous promise for the next day, his face and the dark, grim statues left inside. By dawn, we're above the road which winds beside a river, and the Kambas had chosen this corner for the ambush. This is our camera position on the hillside above, 
and the cumbers are below on a ridge 100 yards to the right, so well camouflaged that you can only just see them moving. Our guard makes sure we don't peer over the ridge at herdsmen below till their backs are to us. The cumbers are nervous that the sun might flash on our lenses and so warn lorries approaching on the road. So our orders are to sit with our guard behind the ridge till the first gunfire. All we could see were stationary trucks and bullets firing at someone hidden beneath. The back's empty, but a cumber runs out to blast the Chinese underneath. There's a Chinese soldier. Though we can see him from our position, the cumbers can't because of the truck, just as we can't see the Chinese behind the trucks further up. Cumbers are desperate to get him, as he could radio to cut our retreat. But he gets to the river bank and slowly creeps away out of our arc of vision. Back at the trucks, the cumbers are still firing at a Chinese we can't see. We think this cumber must have got someone, but all that we can actually see from our position is a tire punctured by his bullets. But then a cumber we hadn't seen slowly staggers across the desert, almost under us. Immediately comes the signal for retreat and all the filming to stop so that they can get the wounded man out. You can just see a blood stain on the back of his left shoulder. And this diagram of the trucks and road shows what happened as it was sorted out afterwards. Most of the cumbers were on this corner and with accurate shooting killed the drivers of the first three trucks in their cabs. Another three or four Chinese hid behind the trucks until Tender got most of them with a grenade. But the fourth truck stopped closer to our position so though we could see the man who escaped, most of the cumbers couldn't. And when the Chinese ran to the river bank out of our camera's arc of vision, only one cumber went after him. This was Gabo, the eldest. He must have gone berserk, for instead of shooting, Gabo ran up close to stab. But when he reached for his knife, he remembered he'd lent it to someone the night before. Just then, the Chinese shot him with a Mauser, and when they grappled on the ground, knocked him partially unconscious. Soon after, the Bren gunner killed the Chinese with a grenade. But when the retreat had been ordered, and he and Tender had carried the old man to a concealed gully, he apparently died in their arms. So they took his religious god box, which never leaves a live cumber, and we started a non-stop 15-hour march for the pass, racing the Chinese patrols, trying to cut us off in the mountains. And three days later, back in Nepal at the cumber camp, a spy from the Chinese garrison at Kirong is being questioned by Tender. The information is that the Chinese reached the ambush shortly afterwards, but he tells Tender no Kamba bodies had been found. Then a local Tibetan brings the amazing news that high in the mountains, above the cloud covering our valley, Gabo, who we'd left for dead, has been found staggering into Nepal. George peels off his blood-stained clothes. Gabo is 52 years old, but amazingly tough. He'd been unconscious for several hours, but somehow the Chinese missed him. And then he'd woken up and staggered back, wounded and foodless, dodging the Chinese patrols. The bullet was fired from low down. It passed close to the heart and out the back. The cuts are where the Chinese battered him with a stone. Once his wounds were dressed, 
Gabo starts to discuss plans for the next raid. And we feel that if Gabo and his patrol are typical of the 5,000-man Kamba army, then we had learnt from this small raid that the Kambas would one day be a serious menace to the Chinese roads. But next day, an idyllic peace hangs over the valley, and war seems unthinkable. But from under the Himalayan calm, the signs of religious violence break to the surface in a ceremony for the patron deity of Dzonka, where the ambush trucks came from. A valley united in hatred. Perhaps the demons of the past are no match for communist China, but they unite the exiles in a craving for vengeance. And in any war between India and China, the hatred swirling about the demon could block the roads when the pinprick raids become the invasion of the Kamba army. sound of inhumanity, the most terrifying sound in the world, the cruel, endless tramp of marching feet as the invader grinds over a small country, bringing desolation, hunger and death. This is the sound that echoes through the Far East. It reached Tibet and only 50,000 Tibetans have managed to escape into freedom. the story of their hopes and beliefs and their longing to return home. evil, no matter how fiercely it blows, cannot extinguish the flame of truth. There was peace on the roof of the world, a quietness that lasted for 1,200 years. The people tilled the earth and bred their yaks, and though there was no abundance, there was no famine, no greed, and no killing. For the spirit of the Lord Buddha filled the land, and a sense of religion pervaded even the wildest places. Of the world beyond, even the spiritual leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, knew little. So we were happy. Desire brings discontent. Happiness springs from a peaceful mind. A hurricane of terror shattered that peace. It was 1959, the year of the wood dragon. The Chinese army had come to liberate the people. The Fred Kano army of Tibet met them bravely and quite unrehearsed. Sticks and stones against high explosive, ancient rifle against machine pistol, iron cannon against howitzer. Civilians were slaughtered by the thousand. The Chinese set out to destroy the spirit and the religion of the people 
and woe betide those who refuse to submit. Crucifixion, burning at the stake, drowning, strangling, the more fortunate was shot. <laughs> The Chinese were intent on destroying the religion. Holy buildings were wrecked, sacred books and prayer flags wantonly destroyed, and the Buddhist priests, the lamas, tortured and killed. Children were torn from their parents and sent to China to be drilled in the communist dogma. To preserve their religion and their old way of life, the people urged the Dalai Lama to flee to India. He knew that resistance would cause further bloodshed. The exodus began. In little groups, or sometimes quite alone, 50,000 people followed him on the long trek over the forbidding mountains. them in their homeland, the communists were busy uprooting the religion of peace, a religion that expects one male from every family to become a lama and devote his life to prayer. religion alive in their new land, the refugees led by the Lamas built a temple in Happy Valley, the women giving what gold and jewels they had left to make it a place of beauty. <laughs> Its library contains the 108 volumes of the Lord Buddha's teaching which the Lama smuggled over the border. This is the center of Tibet in exile, the holy place which binds the people together and holds them to their peaceful way of life. Children are our jewels and our precious hope for the future. of a nation. Such a burden for childish shoulders to bear. Yet even the smallest of these children are quick and eager to learn.
In Happy Valley, beside the Buddhist temple, an entire village has been created for children. Homes and nurseries built by voluntary organizations from all over the world, and a hospital built by the National Christian Council of India. The Indian government provided the school buildings and the many teachers. Healthy bodies, healthy minds. This is the picture the visitor sees, yet almost every child has a story of tragedy or terror. Tensing Norbu, fleeing Tibet on the same night as the Dalai Lama, came across the freezing passes, always in fear of an unpleasant death from the Chinese. In the night. But then we came across and we went through villages and asking for food and shelter. And we got, on the way we had many planes attacks and they attacked us at five, six times. Faith was my support and obedience my only guide, says Mrs. Tearing, who organized the Tibetan children's homes at the request of the Dalai Lama. And the modernization of these medieval people begins here with American and European cast off clothes. For when shirts and trousers, tunics and skirts replace the accustomed robe, a subtle change of outlook must begin. Poor things, they couldn't carry very much of their belongings because they were very anxious to bring their children safely to India. And that's why that uh, these children and their parents are suffering a lot. So we are taking care of these children in the homes. And we get so much help. The people all over the world have so much sympathy towards us that these children are very happy in the homes. Here in safety and love, the children live while their parents work in other parts of India. Here each day, every child says grace at meals, worships for an hour, studies his religion of non-violence, and learns more about the modern world. The National Christian Council of India, supported by Christian Aid and the World Council of Churches, has helped in many ways. Money, food, milk, medicines, even to providing fresh fruit and proteins because monkeys stripped the fruit trees and leopards ate the chickens. In the children lies the only hope for the future, for the old will die and the middle-aged are set in their ways. But the children will fuse the old ways with the new, so they need extra care and attention. Sister Ariel of the Save the Children Fund cares for the sick in this hospital built by Indian Christians. They're the nicest children in the world. They're very uh, good-tempered, very polite, very nice altogether. They never fight. I don't know why, but they're charming children. It takes them about a year to travel from Tibet to India as a rule, and during that time they're <laughs> very short of food, usually. <laughs> Practically anything that is sent to us can be used, even if we don't use it ourselves. We did get a consignment of ice bags that we didn't really need, but we do let the small children play with them so they're not altogether wasted. There's uh, quite a lot of TB up here. It's in the plains that they're pretty bad. They can't stand the hot climate. This is a deaf child. We know that she can't hear and that there's something the matter with her walk. I think she must have had some cerebral illness. We've written to see if we can find out anything, but I don't really expect to. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns. If you have no daughter, give them to your son. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. Pali, go, go, go. The scent of strange flowers, the sound of strange birds. Sun Cho will never see Happy Valley but she can feel the warmth of home.
Beyond the mist, beyond the clouds, the distant icy peaks of home. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. The eternal cry of the exile. Tibetans dream of going back one day, and yet it may be many generations before this dream comes true. Soon after they arrived in Darjeeling, four Tibetans began making carpets in an old cow shed. Now 300 men and women spin wool by hand and toe and dye it in the ancient way using special leaves to produce colors which will not fade. They weave exotic patterns, unknown till now in the Western world, and already the sale of carpets brings in several thousand pounds each year. But no sales ledger can measure their pride in earning their own living again. While the mothers spin, their small children are cared for in a nursery and a creche, with foster parents as well as trained nurses to look after them. Before the centre was opened, nearly 200 Tibetan children were wandering the streets of Darjeeling finding food where they could, begging to stay alive. Now they have free milk, food, clothes, and an education. Not all Tibetans can live in the northern hills within sight of their country, for there is not enough land to farm. Here in southern India, the government cleared 4,000 acres to establish a farming community, giving each man two oxen and a simple course in agriculture. To many, farming was difficult, for they'd been herdsmen. Yet they persevered, they learned, they settled and farmed, working hard to become independent of help from outside. Fighting 
the women too work in the fields, and when they work, they sing. There is always the sound of music, for the Tibetans are a singing race. The bold songs of the nomad Kambas, the pipes of the herdsmen, play music that was born in the wild mountains long, long ago. But often now the words are new and describe the tragedy of their homeland. Even after ten years and more, they are still strangers in their new land. They like to keep to their own kind and marriage with Indians is discouraged. Above all, protected from evil by their prayer flags, they remain strong in their Buddhist faith. The Chinese found it impossible to destroy this faith, even in the teenagers they captured and took back to China. At last, they gave up trying to convert them and took to snatching the infants from their mother's arms. It doesn't take so long to indoctrinate a baby. The Amdo people come from the Great Eastern Gorge, that part of Tibet first invaded by the Chinese in 1950. These dancers were part of a professional troupe and among the very few Tibetans ever to travel outside their homeland. They were in India when the invasion began, and when stories of repression and mass killings came over the border, they chose to remain in exile. They're a happy people, like all Tibetans, and they have the lively sense of humor that goes with an independent spirit. They say there is no clapping tax in India, as there is in Chinese-occupied Tibet. When asked what this means, they explain that in old Tibet, taxes were always paid by extra work, but now there is a new tax. Whenever a Chinese official visits a village, all the people must turn out and clap to show their joy. This is very tiresome. About 25,000 Tibetans live in roadside camps, working on new strategic highways. The Indian government pays them, and the National Christian Council gives much of the extra food and vitamins they need. When they first came to India, they began dying like flies. The heavy enveloping heat, the dust, the humidity, these were conditions they'd never met in their cold, clean mountains. They had no immunity from tropical diseases, malaria, cholera, typhus, dysentery, tuberculosis and leprosy. To help slow the spread of disease, the Indian government and the Christian Council, working closely together, set up mobile clinics on the borders, staffed by Indian and European doctors, many of them Christian missionaries. But these doctors were fighting ignorance and fear as much as disease. A Tibetan still believes that illness is caused by sin, and a sick man will visit his Lama to seek forgiveness, and then to be cured by prayer. It takes time to understand that prayer, except in rare cases, is no substitute for antibiotics and immunization. The call for modern medicine is still great. Near the border, Dr. Duncan, a missionary, runs a hospital and leper colony. It's supported by the Presbyterian okay. Church, gifts from all over the world, and by her extraordinary faith that these gifts will continue to come in as long as the need exists. Tibetans are particularly susceptible to TB because a great many of them in Tibet did not in fact meet the germ until they came to India. 
so therefore they had no immunity at all to protect them. Secondly, they came down, very, many of them taking a long time on the journey. They had no food, and when they got to India, they had a new kind of food to eat which they didn't like, and so they were malnourished. And of course, they had to live in very overcrowded conditions so that if one person had it, very quickly they all had it. This man is a case of TB of the chest, and uh, is beginning to object because we give him so many injections. Little Sonam looks rather pathetic now, but she was, in fact, just a riddle of bones when she first came to us. She has not been fed or loved adequately. Uh, she has rather a sad story. While she was in Tibet and the Chinese trouble started, she actually saw her husband killed, and this affected her mentally, so that when we first knew her, she was a, a very sad sight, uh, behaving rather like Ophelia, wandering around singing with flowers in her hair. This man is a very old friend. He's been with us now for more than five years. When he came to us, he was in already a very bad condition with TB, not only of the lungs, but also of the spine. Right. And uh, it's unlikely that he will be with us very much longer. But our main aim is to uh, treat adequately and also to diagnose early, so that when the disease is in the early stages, we can hit it really hard and cure it. The Indian government has given His Holiness the Dalai Lama sanctuary and offer him their hospitality wherever he goes. His Holiness keeps in close contact with his people and tours the country, visiting them in their camps. This is a very great pleasure, sir. On one of these tours, while passing through New Delhi, he met the Reverend Dr. Harry Haynes, the representative of the World Council of Churches. To his people, the Dalai Lama is divine, the 14th reincarnation of the first Dalai Lama, born centuries ago. Your Holiness, 20 years ago, I visited Gombon when I was a, had just come to China. I understand this is very near to your home. Yes. And now you are a long way from your home <laughs> here with your people. How do you feel about this new situation that you have come into, sir? I am glad to hear that you were once near my birthplace, but since then there have been many changes, all of them bringing much sadness. We are trying to create something valuable here, but we cannot expect quick results. But I am certain that in the end we will succeed and return to our country, because we have truth on our side and truth always prevails. Your Holiness, many who have visited your people here in India have noticed the very great love and affection that you hold for your children. What do you think tomorrow holds for them? We know we are still backward in the field of education and we suffer from it. We do realize the importance of modern knowledge but at the same time, we cannot neglect our own ancient culture and religion, which prepares one for this life and the next. So our children must be taught our own learning, side by side with modern education. And so it has become part of our spiritual duty to help our children by teaching them how to live with the demands and benefits of the modern world without losing their innocence or the ideals of their ancestors. Our children are the jewels and precious hope for our future. With few exceptions, they are very intelligent, capable, and very lovable. Your Holiness, we do not belong to the same faith. I am a Christian. You are the spiritual head of your people. As you have come into contact with Christianity and with other faiths here in India, what has been your experience? Tarani. Although in some ways our faiths and beliefs may be different, our goal is the same. All religions teach us to be simple, to obey the moral law, and to love one another. So it is very important for us to understand each other's religion. Today, there are many people who have no religious beliefs, 
Therefore, it is important that we who do believe live in harmony together and set an example to those who have no faith at all. The remnants of a nation scattered like dust over a vast continent. A holy man as their leader. A man who turns his face against violence and forgives his enemies. Who commands that the children are taught to love and not to kill. What hope have they in a world dominated by brute force and the hydrogen bomb? Yet how precious is their philosophy of peace. How poignant to hear once again the echo of those words spoken nearly 2,000 years ago in Galilee. Love one another. Our children are the jewels and precious hope for our future. evil, no matter how fiercely it blows, cannot extinguish the flame of truth. 